Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. My name is Pamela Miller, and I serve as co-chair of IPEN with Dr. Tedessa Amera, as well as the IPEN Gender Caucus with Dr. Olga Speranskaya. I've been conducting community-based research and citizen science in the Arctic for more than 20 years, and I'm principal investigator for a community-based research project called Protecting Future Generations, supported by the U.S. National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Women have different susceptibilities to chemical exposures because of our different physiologies, different types of occupational exposures, and different uses of chemicals and products, such as cleaning and personal care products. Women are the first environment for children and the first educators of children. Throughout our lives, women are exposed to numerous harmful chemicals that can be transferred across the placenta during fetal development and through breast milk to the nursing infant. Chemical exposures in the womb or in early childhood may cause lifelong harm. Exposures during fetal development increase the risks of such harmful effects as preterm births, birth defects, childhood, and adult diseases. Adverse effects can be carried across multiple generations. We must work to protect women's health because women cannot be empowered nor gender equality achieved if exposures to harmful chemicals cause women to suffer from chronic illnesses, cancers, infertility, or damage to their nervous systems. Gender equality is a fundamental human right. This is an IPEN Women's Caucus meeting at the BRS COP in Geneva in April 2019. This is a woman that we honor with every presentation. Her name is Annie Aloa, a respected elder and health worker from the Yupik community of Savunga on Sivukok, also known as St. Lawrence Island. She had a deep understanding of the health disparities associated with chemical exposures from the former military base on the island and documented diseases, including cancers and reproductive diseases. Her knowledge inspired our community-based research. She herself died of cancer. This is the location of much of our community-based research in citizen science. Sivukok is located in the Northern Bering Sea, just 30 miles from the Chukotkin Peninsula of Russia. And because of its proximity to Russia, it was a place of great strategic importance to the US military that established two large military defense sites during the Cold War that included several hundred personnel, runways, and other infrastructure. The military left a legacy of hazardous waste including massive fuel spills, PCBs, pesticides, and heavy metals. This contamination continues to harm the health of people on the island today and future generations. In addition to the military contamination, people in this region and throughout the circumpolar Arctic have some of the highest exposures to persistent pollutants of any population on Earth because chemicals are carried on wind and ocean currents into the Arctic from lower latitudes. This is a process known as the grasshopper effect. In the cold Arctic environment, persistent and toxic chemicals concentrate in the bodies of fish, wildlife, and people. This slide shows some of the results of a small study by Commonweal and IPEN participating organizations that investigated levels of certain persistent organic pollutants or POPs in women's breast milk. Each bar of the graph represents the results of the levels of toxic industrial chemicals, flame retardants known as polybrominated diphenyl ethers, PBDEs, in the breast milk of first-time mothers from the Philippines, Alaska, Mexico, Kenya, and the Czech Republic. You can see that the women from Alaska, the Arctic, has by far the highest levels. This slide shows the results from the same study showing levels of pesticides in breast milk samples. The breast milk sample from Alaska had the highest overall pesticide concentrations, including the highest concentrations of chlordane and dieldrin, two pesticides banned under the Stockholm Convention. The purpose of the project is to provide a forum for the mothers to tell their stories about the importance of breastfeeding and to speak their concerns about toxic chemical body burdens. Our Indigenous women's leadership trainings have been important in empowering women, offering them training in how to testify and engage in creating policy. We also have talking circles that provide women with the opportunity to share their knowledge and wisdom. These discussions have led to community-based research and citizen science projects, for example, to investigate how chemical exposures may affect neurodevelopment in children. 
We offer an intensive college credited classroom and field course in environmental health science to train community members to conduct their own environmental and health monitoring and research. These are some of the disease patterns witnessed by community leaders such as Annie Aloha and confirmed by our community-based research. We have witnessed health disparities among the people who are closely connected to the Northeast Cape area of the island through their traditional cultural practices and where the military displaced the community. These are some of the key findings of our community-based participatory research now published in the scientific peer-reviewed literature Publications are listed at the end of this presentation. We measured levels of chemicals such as PBDEs and PFAS, per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, in the homes and blood serum of women and men aged 18 to 40. We found different exposures to PBDEs and PFAS, as well as different effects on thyroid in women compared with men. Alaska Community Action on Toxics, ACAT, receives requests for assistance from communities all over Alaska. We've developed trust and community-based research and citizen science partnerships to address concerns about health. We collaborate with world-renowned scientists and train local people. Most importantly, we work with community leaders, healthcare providers, labor groups, and others to achieve policy changes from local to international levels, science informing policy and actions to protect health and the environment. As many of you know, the Stockholm Convention is a global, legally binding treaty to eliminate the world's most dangerous chemicals. It recognizes the need to protect women and through them, future generations. It acknowledges the special vulnerability of indigenous peoples of the Arctic. The carved soapstone statue shown here was presented by Inuit leader Shilawat Cloutier during the negotiations of what was to become the Stockholm Convention. It now sits in front of delegates at every conference of the parties to remind them of their obligation to protect the health and human rights of the most vulnerable. The women here, with Carol Nagarak holding the statue, are part of the Arctic Indigenous Women's Delegation at the Conference of the Parties. This slide begins discussion about an international citizen science project conducted by IPEN and participating organizations to investigate the levels of mercury in women of childbearing age. Mercury is especially toxic to the developing brain and nervous system. From 1932 to 1968, the Chizo Corporation released methyl mercury in wastewater from its chemical factory into Minamata Bay, and it bioaccumulated in fish and shellfish. The residents of Minamata, not realizing there was a danger in doing so, ate fish and shellfish from the bay and the Chiranui Sea, which resulted in widespread mercury poisoning. Tens of thousands of people were affected. Symptoms of mercury poisoning include ataxia, numbness in the hands and feet, muscle weakness, narrowing of the field of vision, and damage to hearing and speech. In extreme cases, paralysis, coma, and death can occur. A congenital form of mercury poisoning can also affect fetuses in the womb. As a result of the immense poisoning in Minamata, mercury poisoning is now sometimes referred to as Minamata disease. This slide is a map of mercury emissions to air from human industrial activities, showing the heavily concentrated emissions from coal-fired power plants in Southeast Asia, India, and China. This slide shows the primary sources of mercury pollution with the leading sources of artisanal small-scale gold mining and coal combustion. Here is a map that explains the process of the coal mercury cycle between Alaska and Asia, whereby coal is stripped mined in Alaska with nearly 100% destined for power plants in Asia. When the coal is burned in Asia, toxic air pollutants, including mercury, are released. Mercury travels back to Alaska through air currents on what has become known as the brown cloud. It is visible from space and crosses the Pacific in about a week. Approximately 20% of the mercury in Alaska is attributed to combustion and coal-fired power plants in Asia. Most human exposure to mercury comes from eating contaminated fish. Mercury was once mined in the Kuskokwim watershed and continues to contaminate the fish downstream from the former mines. Mercury is also released with the mining of gold and other metals. The proposed Donlin Creek gold mine in the upper Kuskokwim 
would be a major source of mercury if developed because the blasting and heating of the ore would release substantial quantities of mercury to the atmosphere and further contaminate the fish and other traditional foods of the indigenous communities along the river. Coal has trace levels of mercury and when burned for energy, releases mercury to the atmosphere where it can be transported and deposited long distances from the source of emissions. Here are some IPEN publications that report on levels of mercury in women of childbearing age. Hair samples were collected by IPEN participating organizations in many countries around the world. IPEN partnered with the Biodiversity Institute to collect and analyze hair samples. The data contributed to the effectiveness evaluation of the Minamata Convention on Mercury with a call to action in proposing a more health protective standard. Of the 1,044 women who participated in the study, 42% had a mercury body burden that exceeded the reference level of one part per million total mercury in hair. For some time, the scientific literature has established that adverse health effects occur at the reference dose of one part per million. However, the latest scientific literature suggests that adverse effects may occur at even lower levels and that a more protective threshold of 0.58 parts per million is needed. We found that mercury pollution poses a serious and substantial threat to the health of women and developing babies in many parts of the world. Locations where the mean or average level for the group of women exceeded the one part per million reference level for mercury were the Cook Islands, Indonesia, Kenya, Kiribati, Marshall Islands, Myanmar, Nepal, Nigeria, Solomon Islands, Thailand, Tonga, and Tuvalu. Women from Alaska, Albania, Chile, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Vanuatu Atu exceeded 0.58 part per million mercury levels as the mean for the group. Specific factors that resulted in elevated levels of mercury in mothers included a fish-rich diet, artisanal small-scale gold mining, or ASGM, and proximity to industrial sources. IPEN stands in solidarity with Shinobu Sakamoto and other victims of Minamata in holding leaders accountable for meeting their demands for justice, health, and preventing harm from mercury contamination now and in the future. Erica Apataki is a community health researcher from Sivukok, St. Lawrence Island, Alaska, making an intervention about the injustice of mercury contamination of the traditional foods of the Yupik people. She collected hair samples for the IPEN Mercury Monitoring Project. The photograph shows Vai Wahi, Yupik mother and grandmother and environmental health and justice program director with Alaska Community Action on Toxics, making an intervention at the Stockholm Convention representing the Indigenous Women's Caucus. The chemicals present in our bodies are passed on to our Indigenous children and harm their ability to learn our languages, songs, stories, and knowledge. We are contaminated without our consent. This is environmental violence. This is a statement made by Indigenous leader Gudgee Cook, Aboriginal midwife, educator, and an elder of the Akwesasne Mohawk Nation. Our grandmas tell us we're the first environment, that our babies inside of our bodies see through the mother's eyes and hear through the mother's ears. Our bodies as women are the first environment of the baby coming, and the responsibility of that is such that we need to reawaken our women to the power that is inherent in that transformative process that birth should be. This is a list of the scientific publications of our community-based research. Thank you.